Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this evening episode of Pursue. And today we have Pursue 7D Neuropathology, and we are streaming live from Kolkata. And with us, we have uh, Dr. Jayati Datta. She is an MD from Kolkata, DND, and she has done a postdoctorate fellowship in oncopathology from Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. And she is a fellow oncopathologist from Tata Medical Center. Presently, she is a consultant histopathologist. In the very famous Dr. Tribedi's Royal Laboratory, Kolkata, and she has got multiple publications in indexed national and international journals. And today she will be speaking on embryonal neoplasm of the central nervous system. Before I ask her to start, let me please request all of you to please keep your mic muted, please keep your camera off, please do not share your screen. And when you join, please press join now and don't press present. With this, let me request Dr. Jayati Datta, ma'am, please take over and start. Thank you so much, please. Thank you for the kind introduction, sir. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I'll just go ahead with my presentation. Yeah, please present. Yeah, I can see your screen coming. Yeah. Yeah, please make it full screen, please. Right, just change your pointer. So the topic of presentation today is embryonal neoplasms of the central nervous system. At the outset, I have uh, given the cover images of these two uh, textbooks of neuropathology. One is the quite essential WHO fascicle and the other is the amazing neuropathology book by famous neuropathologist Professor Eri Perry because many of the images I have used in this presentation are from these books and for those who are interested in neuropathology, these are the basic books to follow. These are my disclosures. I am grateful to my teachers and mentors, Dr. Devashish Guho from my MD days, who started me on my journey of neuropathology. And then I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Paramita Roy, Dr. Jay Mehta, Dr. Divya Mida, and Dr. Zamir Latif sir for guiding me navigating this intriguing world of neuropathology. I, and I would love to acknowledge my current colleagues, Dr. Bhaskar Mitro and Dr. Shobham Chakraborty, for their generous help in cracking the difficult neuropathology cases in my day-to-day -day practice. So, coming to the topic, what are the embryonal neoplasms? These are the proverbial small blue round cell tumors of the central nervous system. They are highly cellular, poorly differentiated, and mitotically active. They are the most common group of malignant tumor that you see in pediatric population and they are biologically very, very aggressive with a tendency to disseminate along the CSF pathways. So the current classification and reporting of neurological tumors are based on this seminal paper that came after the Harlem Consensus Conference that happened in the year 2014 where 28 neuropathologists from 10 different countries attended. And the paper came out in Brent Pathology Journal in the year 2014. And shortly after, the WHO fascicle was updated. So what are the new guidelines? The entities are now narrowly defined as much as possible. And layered and integrated reports are must now 
So there are four layers to the report. The first layer is the integrated diagnosis, including all the information that have been obtained from that tissue. The second layer is the histological classification. The third layer is the WHO grade. And the fourth layer, whenever available, is the molecular testing information. And with this, a major restructuring of medulloblastomas and other embryonal tumors happened, including removal of the term primitive neuroectodermal tumor. So remember, the term PNET is not used in neuropathology anymore. So what does the classification look like now? You can see the medulloblastoma now can be classified in two different ways. First is the histologically defined medulloblastomas, which you can subcategorize by looking at your IHC and reticulin stem slides. And they are four types. Classic, the desmoplastic nodular variety, medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity, and lastly, the large cell anaplastic variety. And then medulloblastomas can also be genetically defined. Those are the wind activated medulloblastoma, the sonic hedgehog activated medulloblastoma, which can again be subdivided into TP50, TP53 mutant and TP53 wild type. And then the non wind non SHH medulloblastomas, which can be group 3 or group 4. For medulloblastomas, where we don't know this molecular informations and we don't have enough tissue for histologically classifying it either we can call it medulloblastoma not otherwise specified this group forms the bulk of the embryonal tumors in cns but there are other embryonal tumors as well like embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosette that is etmr c19 mc is altered which can be supratentorial or infratentorial, then atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor and other CNS embryonal tumor. So I'll deal with all of this in uh, detail in my subsequent slides. Now, before coming to various entities, we must know why we should learn to differentiate among various entities. That is why we should be splitters. Why don't lump it all together? Because there is a difference in prognosis and therapy. In terms of prognosis, the five-year survival differs between medulloblastoma and other embryonal tumor. Medulloblastomas have 40 to 90% survival depending on different subtypes, whereas the other embryonal tumor like atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, that is your ATRT, Embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosette, that is your ETMR, have a poorer survival, which can range up to 30%. ETMR has a medium survival of only 12 months. And then the therapeutic strategies are also different. Like for aggressive tumors like ATRT, that is atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, you need high dose alkylating agents with craniospinal irradiation. Then more and more uh, the development is being made for targeted therapy that are tailored towards tumor genetics like the sonic hedgehog pathway medulloblastomas are now being treated with smoothened inhibitors. And then de-escalation of therapy can be considered in better prognostic groups of medulloblastomas to reduce long-term sequel. So these are the reasons for which we should learn to differentiate between various entities. Now, how to differentiate them? First, I will begin with medulloblastoma. As I said earlier, they are the most common CNS embryonal tumor representing more than 90% of cases. How do you define a medulloblastoma? So, it is the embryonal neuroepithelial tumor arising in cerebellum or dorsal brainstem. 77% of them occur before 19 years. We can see a bimodal peak, one of which is in 3 to 4 years and another in 8 to 9 years. Infants also 
constitute 10 to 15 percent of cases. In children more than three years, males are affected twice more frequently than females, but there is no such sex predilection in children less than three years. About one third of patients will have CSF metastasis at presentation. Adult cases do occur, but they are less common and they are mostly seen in age group of 21 to 40 years. Now coming to the histologic subgrouping of medulloblastomas. The bulk of them, that is up to 70 to 80 percent, are of classic type. So how does a classic medulloblastoma look like? They are highly cellular, small blue round cell tumor, where the individual cells have scanty cytoplasm. The nucleoli are not prominent, and you can see molding of nucleoli, brisk mitosis, karyorexis. That is the archetypal small blue round cell tumor morphology. You can see larger foci of tumor necrosis. However, the palisading necrosis that, that uh, you commonly see in glioblastoma is usually not seen here. You can also see vascular endothelial proliferation and it does not exclude the diagnosis. Nodular foci of neuronal differentiation can be seen. They look like a pale nodule which are less cellular and comprising of small mature oligodendrogyma-like nuclei with clear halos in the cytoplasm and neuropil in the background. Another characteristic feature which is not always uh, seen in HE sections is homerite rosette. I have highlighted the rosettes here. If you see this, this is the definite evidence of neuronal differentiation. And another unique feature that is sometimes seen in classic medulloblastoma is streaming of nuclei. They look like this. So linear array or parallel rows of neoplastic cells can be seen. The next group is desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma. They are commonly seen in children less than three years of age. And they commonly arise in the cerebellar hemisphere rather than fourth ventricle. They are typified by foci of differentiation, that is weakly proliferative reticulin-free pale islands of increased cytoplasm and neuropil formation. The background is highly proliferative, reticulin-rich cellular tumor. And if you do IFC, the nodules display a more differentiated phenotype using neuronal and glial markers. I'll uh, elaborate on the molecular profiling later, but here I like to add that desmoplastic nodular medulloblastomas commonly show mutation in sonic hedgehog pathway, and this can be identified by a surrogate immunostain GABA. I'll detail on it later. So this is the image of desmoplastic nodular blast, uh, medulloblastoma, a small blue round cell tumor with some pale nodules. And if you do a reticulin, these pale nodules are reticulin poor and the intervening internodular areas are reticulin rich tumor. And here the nodules are more differentiated. So if you put neuronal markers like here I have shown new N. Similar image would also be obtained if you put synaptophysin. This nodule should be strongly positive, whereas the internodular area would be weaker. And the similar image can be seen in a glial marker like GFAP also. So the nodules will be more differentiated and reticulin poor. The internodular area would be less differentiated and reticulin rich. The third category of histologic classification of medulloblastoma is MBEN, that is medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity. Like your desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma, this variety also occurs almost exclusively in infant. Here, the reticulin-free pale nodules predominate. You can see the nodules back to back with very less cellular areas in between. And they also have a good prognosis 
and mutation in sonic hedgehog pathway and therefore they are positive for gab1 occasional such examples especially in the setting of post therapy biopsy can show ganglionic maturation and therefore ganglion neuroblastoma needs to be differentiated in those cases the fourth category is the large cell anaplastic variety and as you can see in this image this is no longer looking like the proverbial small blue round cell tumor the cells are much larger they show nucleoli they show nuclear anaplasia that is they have increased nuclear size with striking pleomorphism nuclear molding they have a unique feature of wrapping of cells around one another and they also show cannibalism bizarre multinucleated giant cell and apoptotic clades they look aggressive and they also behave in the most aggressive fashion they are very less responsive to therapies there are other rare morphologic variants like medulloblastoma with myogenic differentiation and medulloblastoma with melanotic differentiation medulloblastoma with myogenic differentiation shows skeletal muscle differentiation as i have shown in this image you can see mature rhabdoid looking cells with pink cytoplasm sometimes you can even see cross striation and if you put immuno this skeletal muscle differentiation uh, the, this area showing skeletal muscle differentiation would be positive for all your myoid markers like desmin sma etc and where the medulloblastoma is showing melanotic differentiation you commonly see structures looking like retinal pigment epithelia here in the image you can see this retinal pigment epithelium interspersed between this small blue round cell tumor but you should remember that these are mere morphologic variants and still that there is no clear clinical significance attached to this but you should be aware of these entities so that you can diagnose now coming to the genetically defined medulloblastoma group so there are four genetic subgroups the sonic hedgehog activated group the wnt pathway activated group and the non wnt non sonic hedgehog group which is further sub classified into group 3 and group 4 now first we will try to understand the biologic basis of this genetic classification so the i'll start with the commonest one the sonic hedgehog activated medulloblastoma which form about one third of cases so here the cytogenetic aberration is loss of the small arm of chromosome 17 with duplication of the long arm that is formation of isochromosome 17q and for this the tumor suppressor genes on the small arm of chromosome 17 that inhibits the sonic hedgehog signaling are lost these are the genes which regulate the cerebellar granular cell layer proliferation and that is the underlying molecular mechanism for all sonic hedgehog activated medulloblastoma and this group can further be subdivided into tp53 mutated group and tp53 wild type group the tp53 mutated group has a poorer prognosis and they show mycn mutation they can show nodular desmoplastic or large cell anaplastic morphology and the tp53 wild type group have a better prognosis and they all they can show desmoplastic nodular or mben histology that is medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity all these medulloblastomas that are driven by shh activation are positive for the surrogate marker we have that is gab1 yak1 a cell proliferation marker is positive in both sonic hedgehog activated and wnt mutated medulloblastomas and p53 mutation can be detected using ihc for p53 we will detail on this later the second common group is 
wind activated medulloblastoma sorry which forms about 10% of the medulloblastoma so here the underlying molecular event is translocation of beta catenin from cytoplasm to the nucleus and this group of medulloblastomas can involve the dorsal brain stem or middle cerebellar peduncle they typically occur in children and young adult that is unlike the sonic hedgehog activated medulloblastomas they occur in non infants most commonly these tumors have classic histology however large cell anaplastic morphology can also be seen 90% of these tumors have monosomy of chromosome 6 and ctnnb1 mutation either of which can be exploited for genetic confirmation as anyone doing ihc on a routine basis will agree with me that beta catenin ihc can be very very hard to interpret at times because all medulloblastomas show cytoplasmic beta catenin positivity and to detect true nuclear positivity differentiating from cytoplasmic positivity in a small blue round cell tumor can get on your nerve at times and this wind activated medulloblastomas have excellent prognosis with surgery and adjuvant chemotherapy and they have nearly 100% survival and therefore a strong recommendation is going on for deescalating therapy in this subgroups because the craniospinal irradiation have major long term complications in the survivors the third and fourth group that is non wind non shh medulloblastomas the molecular event is formation of isodicentric 17 q that is here also there is a cytogenetic break in the chromosome 17 but it is not within the centromere rather it is near the centromere so the result in formation of two closely opposed centromeres so this table i have copied from a seminal paper that came in year 2012 in acta neuropathologica they summarize our current molecular understanding of medulloblastoma so you can see there are four groups which activated the sonic hedgehog pathway medulloblastomas the non wind non shh which can further be subdivided into <coughs> group 3 and group 4 and wind pathway medulloblastomas have the best prognosis as you can see very good prognosis and in addition you see monosomy 6 and ctnnb1 mutation this image means the the patient of wind pathway medulloblastomas are typically non infant they are children or young adult the shh pathway medulloblastomas classically show desmoplastic nodular or classic or large cell anaplastic morphology they can occur in infant children and young adult and they can again be p53 mutated or p53 wild type the group 3 and group 4 medulloblastomas as i said are characterized by formation of isodicentric chromosome 17 and they can show mic amplification or mycn amplification you can also kind of uh, exploit this information in interpreting your hne slide also like if you have a classic medulloblastoma they can belong to any of the four molecular category but if you have a desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma they are commonly sonic hedgehog activated so don't underestimate your routine hne and reticulin stain because the game starts there a, a lot of molecular information can be predicted from hne stain also so here is the risk stratification of medulloblastomas so you can see from the table if you have the molecular information and histology combining these two you can 
predict the risk of that medulloblastoma. Like wind activated medulloblastoma with classic histology is typically a low risk tumor. Whereas SHH activated medulloblastoma, if they are TP53 wild type and showing you a dysmoplastic nodular morphology, they are typically low risk tumor occurring in infant less than three years of age. Whereas SHH activated medulloblastomas, if they are TP53 mutant and showing you large cell anaplastic morphology, they are typically high risk tumor and occurring in non-infant. So, how do we group the medulloblastoma into different molecular categories using IHC? So, you can see you need molecular department, but also routine IHCs can also help you in this regard. So, majority of the understanding of IHC-based molecular subgrouping of medulloblastoma was summarized by this seminal uh, in this seminal paper uh, by this group from david w wilson that came out in acta neuropathologica in the year 2011 so they recommended a panel of four immunostains gab1 beta catenin filamine and yap you should note from this table that Beta-catenin, to be significant, has to be nuclear as well as cytoplasmic. GAB1 and filamin A are cytoplasmic stains, but YAP1 stains both the nuclei and cytoplasm. So it's a combined nuclear and cytoplasmic stain. Beta-catenin is used for WNT activated tumor. YAP1 and filamin A are used for both sonic hedgehog and WNT activated tumor and GAB1 is used for sonic hedgehog pathway tumors. A combined panel of antibodies is advised because at times antibodies can show patchy staining. So having more than one in your inventory will help you to form a confident diagnosis. Now elaborating on the IHC based molecular subgrouping of medulloblastoma I'll start with beta catenin. Please note, I have copied the clone they have used in the paper because we should be aware that the performance of antibody is highly dependent on the clone being used, on the platform being employed. So before starting with a new IHC, one must search the uh, publications regarding performance of that particular clone. So coming to my IHCs, beta catenin is employed for detecting the wind pathway medulloblastomas and it can show nuclear reactivity in three patterns. Combined blanket like cytoplasmic and nuclear immunoreactivity, a variable nuclear staining, a strong nuclear staining in more than 10% of cells with weak or negligible nuclear staining in the surrounding. You should remember the caveats that is scattered nuclear staining of less than 2% of cells are not wind activated tumors and cytoplasmic staining of beta catenin as I mentioned before also has to be disregarded. Now uh, regarding this cytoplasmic staining almost all medulloblastoma will show some cytoplasmic beta catenin. However, cluster of neurocytic cells in classic tumors can be immunonegative and desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma characteristically show enhanced cytoplasmic immunoreactivity within nodules. So uh, you can uh, see these patterns in uh, this subgroup. So these are my images of beta catenin. This is the blanket like strong and diffuse nuclear and cytoplasmic positivity. If you have this, you can make a diagnosis in scanner also. Then next common pattern is variable nuclear staining, variable but strong. Then 
the third pattern is nuclear staining in more than 10% of cells along with uh, weak nuclear staining in the surrounding this pattern in the fourth image is non specific cytoplasmic staining and it needs to be disregarded and these are the two uh, intriguing patterns in non wind medulloblastomas this is a classic medulloblastoma in my fifth image where the nodules of neurocytic differentiation differentiation do not show cytoplasmic positivity the background small blue round cell tumor have diffuse cytoplasmic positivity for beta catenin and this is a desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma where the nodules show strong cytoplasmic stain the second antibody commonly used is gab1 for detecting the sonic hedgehog pathway medulloblastoma gab1 has a cytoplasmic staining so this is the pattern of staining in desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma there is a strong diffuse cytoplasmic staining in the internodular region but the nodules are either immunonegative or show negligible reactivity the non desmoplastic nodular medulloblastomas that are uh, sonic hedgehog pathway activated will show diffuse cytoplasmic staining the third image is showing yap1 staining because gab1 staining can be weak and patchy we kind of supplement with filamin a or yap1 and the fourth image is of non mint non sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas that are negative for gab1 and yap1 the third immuno stain that is commonly employed is filamin a again a cytoplasmic stain the staining pattern is similar to uh, gab1 the classic medulloblastoma tends to show diffuse cytoplasmic staining whereas the desmoplastic nodular medulloblastomas shows uh, negligible or weak reactivity within the nodules and internodular areas show strong cytoplasmic staining here the fourth image is non shh non wind medulloblastoma that is negative and you can see the blood vessels you can see blood vessel here and the reactive astrocytes 1 and 2 here they can serve you as internal control the fourth immuno stain commonly used is yap1 this is cytoplasmic as well as nuclear stain desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma again shows a strong staining in the internodular region and scattered cells within the nodules quasi nodular tumor will only show weak nodular staining for yap1 and again like uh, gab1 the non sonic hedgehog and non mint medulloblastoma that is group 3 group 4 medulloblastoma will be negative and here also the blood vessels will provide the positive internal control within the tube the pictures may appear very easy but there are many challenges in ilc based molecular subgrouping commercial availability of specific antibodies is often an issue there is lot to lot variability of the antibodies there is inter institutional differences in tissue fixation and embedding there is difference in ilc protocol performance across different platforms there is inter and intra observer variability in image interpretation because of weak cytoplasmic staining at 6 o'clock in the afternoon can be positive for you and can be negative for your colleague there is biological variability in patient cohort but more than all of this technical difficulties many of the scientists are of opinion that using a single marker protein for identifying each molecular subgroup is too simplistic an approach to classify medulloblastoma molecularly so to circumvent that criticism a consensus was held 
by internal international society of neuro oncology that is isno on the method of molecular subgrouping of medulloblastoma so it was uh, the consensus uh, was that subgroup assignment should be done based on two independent validated analytical method that is you have to use two parallel methods ihc along with a molecular uh, method to confirm a molecular subgroup like for example for wind pathway tumor using nuclear beta catenin by ihc and monosomy 6 by fish or single nucleotide polymorphism array will confirm that they are wind pathway tumor or you can go for uh, dna methylation profiling to detect ctnn b1 mutation wind pattern to reiterate the fact nuclear beta catenin ihc or monosomy 6 cannot be used alone because these markers have prognostic implication only in wind subgroup and can occasionally be observed in other subgroups as well an ihc of nuclear beta catenin alone can lead to incorrect diagnosis as patchy nuclear staining can be seen in non wind cases also similarly the sonic hedgehog group 3 and group 4 medulloblastoma can be identified using genome wide methylation expression array methods and limited gene expression panels so shortly after this in the year 2017 the indian society of neuro oncology came up with a consensus guideline for management and diagnosis of medulloblastoma and this paper came out as a commentary in pathology panorama so the mandatory test for rendering a histopathologic diagnosis of medulloblastoma were hematoxylin and eosin that is your good old hne and reticulin you need a he and reticulin stain to make a diagnosis of medulloblastoma it is preferable though optional if facilities are available to use some ihc markers so that you can confirm the neuronal differentiation and the ihc markers commonly employed include synaptopsin neuron specific knowledge neuronal nuclei that is new n and then there are map2 that is microtubule associated protein 2 and class 3 beta tubulin those are less commonly used you need some ihcs if you have a differential diagnosis of morphologically similar tumor that can occur in posterior fossa so the common differential diagnosis include high grade glioma with small cell here you would require a gfab idh1r132h atrx and in pediatric subgroup for the midline gliomas you will need h3k27 the trimethylated version if your differential is anaplastic ependymoma if you will need ema and it is better to have an l1 cam if your dd is atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor particularly uh, this comes as a dd if your patient is less than 3 years of age and showing a classic or large cell anaplastic morphology you will need ihc for ini1 and brg1 if you see multilayer rosette uh, and uh, embryonal tumor with multilayer rosette that is your etmr is um, uh, your differential you will need this ihc lin 28a then optimal ihcs and molecular testing for extended workup of medulloblastoma if and when available include ihcs for beta catenin filamin a gap 1 and yap 1 and molecular test like gene expression profiling microrna expression profiling and fish for semic and nmic amplification monosomy 6 and 11 p53 mutation p10 deletion etc one word about using ihc for detecting tp53 mutation so if you employ a p53 ihc you are seeing p53 protein expression and that can serve 
as surrogate for TP53 mutation if and only if more than 50% of cells are showing strong nuclear staining of at least SCOT2. All other patterns are considered wild type and this guideline came after the seminal paper by Yuri Tabori on P53 mutation in medulloblastoma. And this is the image. If your P53 IHC is looking like this, that is strong and diffuse nuclear positivity of at least code 2 in more than 50% of cells, you can think that medulloblastoma is P53 mutated. But patchy nuclear staining has to be wild type. So, this is the format for integrated diagnosis of medulloblastoma as per the 2016 update. So, the integrated diagnosis is medulloblastoma followed by histologic subtype, histologic grade and molecular subgroup. So, it would look like medulloblastoma, then either classic or desmoplastic nodular or medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity or large cell anaplastic subtype. They are always grade 4 and then if you can employ IHCs and molecular tests for subgrouping, you can classify them as WNT activated, sonic hedgehog activated with P53 mutation or P53 wild type and non-mint non-sonic hedgehog medulloblastomas. Briefly on other CNS embryonal tumors, this category embryonal tumor with multilayered rosette now encompasses all those tumors that were previously classified as ependymoblastoma, medulloepithelioma, or etantia, that is, embryonal tumor with abundant neuropil and true rosette. And they show multi layered perivascular rosette and neuropil in the background. They are typified by a molecular event that is, amplification of microRNA cluster at chromosome 19. And we have a surrogate for that. They show strong and diffuse staining with lin 28A. For the gynepath enthusiast, you will probably uh, recognize this IXC as stem cell marker. We commonly use this in ovarian germ cell tumors. And this ETMR has very poor prognosis. So the layered WHO diagnosis would be embryonal tumor with multilayered rosette. C19 MC altered, WHO grade 4 and the molecular study C19 MC amplification. And if all this is not available, you have to call it embryonal tumor with multilayer rosette, not otherwise specified, that is NOS. A talk on embryonal neoplasm would never be complete if I don't mention about atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. They are rare tumor typically affecting infant and young adult. They are characterized by highly aggressive behavior. Often they have a biphasic morphology with a small blue round cell tumor component resembling medulloblastoma where you can see intermingled or separately present sheets of cells that have these eccentric nuclei and voluminous eosinophilic cytoplasm that are called rhabdoid cells. They are polyphenotypic by IHC, that is they can show EMA, cytokeratin, GFAP, synaptophysin, neuron specific knowledge and the rhabdoid cell may sh even show myoid markers like desmin and smooth muscle actin. So you can go astray if you want to diagnose an ATRT by using these IHCs because they will lead you nowhere. Anything and everything can be focal and patchy in ATRT. What you need to know is that you have to recognize this rhabdoid cell on HE stain slide and then you have to employ the characteristic IHC that is INI1 because most of these ATRTs are characterized by deletion of smart cb one gene and they are characterized by loss of INI1. A uh, less common variety of this will show mutation in the smart ca 4 They will lead to loss of BRG1 protein. 
So this is the IHC for desmin. They are highlighting these rhabdoid cells, and this is the defining IHC for ATRT as an entity is that INI1. And you can see the blood vessels and lymphocytes all will serve as internal control in your tissue and they will be positive. So this is my layered diagnosis for ATRT, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor, WHO grade 4. Molecular study is loss of INI1 staining by IHC. And please keep this image in your brain of rhabdoid cell. Entric nuclei, voluminous cytoplasm that have a dense eosinophilic character. You have to identify these cells on h &E so that you can order an INI1 and strike a diagnosis. Otherwise, no matter how many IHCs you put, you can never reach a diagnosis of atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors. Now coming to some cases. I have, uh, I'll start with this quote by Dale Carnegie is that learning is an active process. We learn by doing. Only knowledge that is used sticks to your mind. We also have Sanskrit sloka for that. Pustakastha tu ya vidya parahastagatam dhanam. So the knowledge cannot be limited to book. You have to use it in day-to-day -day life so that you gain an expertise in that. So with this, my first case. Uh, another thing that I cannot emphasize more is that in neuropathology, a lot of your diagnosis depends on location of the tumor. It's like real estate. Location matters. So if you are receiving neuropathology samples, you have to insist on CT brain. And I insist on good quality plates to be received so that I can get it reviewed by the radiologist. And it helps a lot of time. Like uh, the uh, two weeks back in our lab, we had a case of ependymoma, which showed extensive lipomatous metaplasia. And the outside CT report just said uh, it was uh, frontoparietal as well. Now, when this scan was sent for radiology review, the radiologist told me, hey, there's an entrapped ventricle in that mass. And then I kind of... I was able to crack it that it was an ependymoma indeed, which was just so showing extensive lipomatous metaplasia. So the CT scan helps. So here is my first image. It's a young adult presenting with cerebellar mass. You can see the mass here. There were signs and symptoms associated with mass effect and increased intracranial pressure. And these are my HE images of low power and high power. You can see the characteristic small blue round cell tumor with sheets of Darkly stained cells with scanty cytoplasm, nuclear molding, risk mitosis, apoptosis. And if you hunt long enough, you can kind of appreciate some rosette-like formation. So with this, you have a diagnosis of small blue round cell tumor that is showing some rosette. That is, there are some neuronal differentiation. You order the IHCs now. You do a synapto and GPAP. So you have some synaptopositivity. So it is indeed an embryonal tumor showing neuronal differentiation. You have reached your diagnosis. This is medulloblastoma, classic histology, WHO grade 4, molecular studies not performed. So medulloblastoma, classic histology, WHO grade 4, not otherwise specified. Suppose you have beta catenin in your IHC, uh, IHC inventory. You put that antibody and it comes as strong and diffuse uh, nuclear positivity in uh, a good number of cells. And then you have a allied molecular department and you send this tissue for fish. And the report comes as loss of chromosome 6 or monosomy 6. So if you have that, your diagnosis can be updated. You will call it medulloblastoma, wind activated, classic histology, WHO grade 4, molecular studies, nuclear beta catenin expression with monosomy 6. If I go back to that uh, neuropathologic, acta neuropathologica paper of 2012, this is the group of wind activated medulloblastoma, and you know you have rendered a diagnosis 
which is a good news for the patient because it has very good prognosis and nearly 100% survival. This patient would survive C adulthood and would probably not be requiring an aggressive craniospinal irradiation. My second case, again a cerebellar tumor in uh, a child of three years of age. This is my low power image. So you can see now, this is a small blue round cell tumor, but I have some intermixed pale nodules. And if I go to this pale nodules in higher power, pardon my images, because these are mostly consult cases. Uh, so um, they will show you uh, neuronal morphology that is oligodendroma glioma like nuclei with nuclear uh, perinuclear halo and neuropil in the background then you order a reticulin stain and your reticulin stain looks like this the nodules are reticulin poor and the internodular areas are reticulin rich again you order your synapto and ki67 the synapto is typically strongly positive in the nodule with weak expression in the internodular area. And the reverse is true for KI 67, where the nodules are less positive, but the internodular area is giving you a brisk KI 67. You have reached your diagnosis. This is metloblastoma with dysmoplastic nodular histology, WHO grade 4, and you don't have molecular studies yet. If you, your lab is a bit more equipped, you have GAB1 and YAP1 in your inventory. The GAB1 is showing diffuse cytoplasmic staining in the nodular as well as internodular areas. YAP1 is showing strong staining in the internodular area with patchy scattered staining in the nodules. Then you send it to, you can update your diagnosis now, medulloblastoma, sonic hedgehog activated with dysmoplastic nodular morphology, WHO grade 4, and you have to confirm it by molecular studies. And if you go back to this table of acta neuropathologica again, you know SHH pathway medulloblastomas have good prognosis in infant, particularly if they are P53 wild type. This is my third case. This is no longer looking like a small blue round cell tumor. This is again a cerebellar tumor. So here the cells are looking more aggressive. They have this uh, bizarre tumor giant cell. Some of the cells are showing nucleoli. And here I have uh, uh, captured the apoptotic lake. That is large areas of necrosis where you can only see apoptotic, apoptotic debris of nuclei. So this morphology uh, is commonly seen in large cell anaplastic medulloblastoma. And you send the block to the molecular department for fish. And they tell you that it has MYC amplification. Then your diagnosis would be medulloblastoma with large cell anaplastic histology, WHO grade 4, and the molecular study showing MYC amplification. If I go back to this table, medulloblastoma, large cell anaplastic morphology, weak amplification commonly belongs to group 3 non wind non-SHH medulloblastoma and they have a poor prognosis. If the molecular lab tells you they have n amplification in the same tumor, you will know large cell anaplastic morphology with weak and amplification is group 4 medulloblastoma of non wind non SHH medulloblastoma subtype, and they have intermediate prognosis. New brain tumor entities are also emerging from this uh, drive of molecular classification of CNS neuroectodermal tumors. Of this, the uh, important ones are neuroblastoma and ganglioneuroblastoma, the Ewing sarcoma family of tumor and uh, CIC altered tumors, then high-grade neuroectodermal tumors with astroblastoma phenotype and your BCOR altered uh, neuroectodermal tumors. They are uh, less common and you need a, a molecular lab to identify all this. However, 
I have kind of a roundabout way to uh, at least uh, guess that this needs molecular uh, study. Like if I have a non-cerebellar, non-pineal, intrapineal, embryonal tumor, and I have excluded that it is not a hematolymphoid malignancy, and it is not a histone-mutated midline glioma, the first marker I'll uh, order is INI1 or BRG1, sometimes two of them together. If I can document a loss, it is a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. If they are retained, the second marker I would order is LIN28A. Or uh, I can send the block for FISH for chromosome 19 microRNA cluster amplification. If that is positive, it is embryonal tumor with multilayer droset. If the LIN28A IHC is focal positive or negative, or the fish department tells me that C19MC is not amplified, I need CD99 or NKH2.2. If it is positive, I'd order for EWSR1 gene rearrangement. And if that is positive, I am dealing with a rarer but possible diagnosis of intracranial event sarcoma. If the CD99 is negative for membrane or staining and fish is not showing any EWSR1 gene rearrangement, I'd send out the block for BEC or IHC. And if that is diffuse positive, this is probably high-grade neuroepithelial tumor with BEC or alteration. If the BEC or IHC is negative, I have no other armament uh, in my inventory. I'll just call it embryonal tumor, not otherwise specified, and advise molecular studies. So that's kind of a wrap up. I want you all to take this last image home. Medulloblastomas are the commonest category of embryonal tumor. Wind activated medulloblastoma can show strong diffuse beta catenin positivity and they have the best prognosis. The sonic hedgehog activated medulloblastomas will show desmoplastic nodular morphology that you can confirm or diagnose by using a simple reticulin stain that you have your lab uh, you have at your lab and they have good prognosis for infant all other medulloblastomas in group 3 and group 4 doesn't have uh, don't have this good prognosis group 3 if they have meek amplification has poor prognosis particularly if they have a large cell anaplastic histology Embryonal tumor with multilayer droset shows C19MC amplification and you have a surrogate IHC for that, that is your LIN28A and ATRT is a diagnosis which you have to keep in mind and you have to recognize those rhabdoid cells and order an INI1 and BRT1 when needed and it has a very poor prognosis. So that's all and this is my last message. The starting point is morphology even today because the game began there. However, you can no longer ignore molecular pathology, especially if you are dealing with brain tumors and keep your head buried in HNE. That's all for today. I should profoundly thank you for kind attention. And uh, this is my the slide of references. Wonderful, wonderful, extremely very good, very well done, Dr. Jayati. Excellent talk. I think most of the issues uh, of uh, embryonal tumors have been dealt with and dealt very, very nicely. I would request you to stop presenting so that people can see you. There are a lot of questions on YouTube and the audience here on Google Meet. If they want to ask anything directly, they can unmute their mic and they can ask Dr. Jayati who is an expert in embryonal tumors of the CNS, any questions or queries they have. Anybody can unmute their mic. Before I go in for questions on the YouTube, there are many questions on YouTube. There was a wonderful talk by Dr. Rajiv Shukla sometime back on uh, Evings family tumor. I think you must have heard that. Yeah. Uh, he had spoken very much on the molecular aspects and how by using molecular 
methodology, the Ewing's family could be, you know, further separated into various smaller types. And molecular activities is now a must in all these embryonal tumors, germ cell tumors. Right. So and is there any question is there if anybody... And good news yeah, is please. that many surrogate marker are coming for uh, these molecular subtypes. So, uh, you know, you have a uh, IHC at your inventory and you can diagnose this molecular subtype and that's really great. Yeah, that's very good. That's true. Absolutely correct. So, is there anybody who would like to ask questions on the, from the Google Meet here before I go in for the questions uh, on the YouTube? Dr. Uttara has just joined. She had joined earlier also. Um, Paramita was also there, and then she, I think she had, she was busy. She had left. Dr. Debashish Gua, one of one of your mentor, he is also here. Yeah. Okay, let me ask questions which have been put up on the YouTube. Uh, we have Hanan Akli who would like to say good evening everyone. How to distinguish morphologically a classic medulloblastoma from a penuloblastoma? Uh, so all of these are uh, small uh, blue round cell tumor. Medulloblastoma is defined by location. They occur in cerebellum and dorsal brainstem. And uh, uh, your radiologist would uh, be able to guide you in that matter. And uh, for uh, further classification, because you know morphology and IHC cannot really uh, subtype the small blue round cell tumors because all of this will show some neuronal differentiation. So you need location, and then you need uh, molecular studies. Right. I mean, she also has another same person also has one more question. Is there GFAP expression in medulloblastoma? Yes. Medulloblastoma can show GFAP positive. It does show GFAP positivity most of the times, but they are uh, not like your glial tumors. Uh, they are not strong and diffuse. They are usually patchy. And uh, the desmoplastic nodular variety will show more uh, GFAP expression in the uh, nodules. And the small blue round cell tumor is characteristic. The small blue round cell areas, that is the areas uh, within, uh, in between two nodules, will be weak or negative. Okay, Dr. Minish Gandhi. Dr. Minish Gandhi also has a question, and his question is: What is the cutoff percentage of tumor cells in INI one loss for ATRT? So all the tumor cells would lose INI1. Whatever positive you should see in uh, ATRT in uh, INI1 IHC should be your blood vessel endothelium and tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. Because they are, you must understand, they are clonal proliferation. All of them have the same genetic underlying event. So all of them should be negative for INI1. Yeah, basically, if your if your IHC is good, so it should be hundred percent off. And Dr. if you can understand that your IHC is working, because you will always have some internal control in the tissue. Right. Your tumor tissue will always have some blood vessel, one or two lymphocyte that will tell you that your IHC is working. Right. Doctor Minesh Gandhi also has another question: Should all embryonal tumors in pediatric patients screen for DICER1 mutation? Uh, pardon me, sir. What mutation? DICER1 uh, one mutation. Ah, DICER1 one. One mutation. Uh, not really. DICER1 mutation is an uh, upcoming mutation uh, that is being investigated in a lot of pediatric tumor, particularly the uh, poorly differentiated Sartori Leydig cell tumors, etc. But not all embryonal tumor need uh, DICER1 mutation analysis, particularly not in medulloblastomas. Yeah. And, uh, are you are you tired? There's one more question. Yeah. No, no, sir. I can I can take a few more. Mukta Meel has a question for you. She says that can embryonal tumor arise at extra dural from the fifth cranial nerve? I think it extra must be extra dural from fifth cranial nerve. Uh, uh, extra dural location would be you know unusual unless it's a metastasis. All right. The primary yeah. origin would be unusual. Yeah, it must be some unusual case presentation or must be an unusual case reported which she must be quoting. Also. 
Great. So well done. Excellent. You have handled the questions equally well. And uh, so now let me come to the comments. Mahamaya Sharma from PGI Chandigarh. She says, thanks a lot for an excellent presentation. Nozat Sahid says, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Mohamita Panja says, excellent and very lucid presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And it was a wonderful presentation on embryonal tumors, I think. All those people who overnight would be watching this video by tomorrow morning, there'll be hundreds and hundreds of people seeing it. And we shall be sharing the PDF very soon. This would be a very important document and then video for everybody who would like to understand embryonal tumors. Well done, Dr. Jaiti. Thank you so much. Wonderful. God bless you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir.